Shalom and welcome to the 613 Commandments Exposition, where we take a look at the 613 Commandments of Torah and learn how to apply them to our hearts, our lives, and our minds here in the 21st century in an acceptable cultural 21st century way. Now, today we're going to be tackling a very tawdry, uh, sensitive topic in regards to scriptures and commandments. We know that the 613 commandments legislated virtually every aspect of a person's life from their occupations, because there's certain commandments uh, dealing with agricultural farmers and husbandmen um, and people that deal with uh, um, uh, produce and cattle and animals, farming, uh, farming the land, etc. We know that there's certain um, commandments dealing with even what we're to wear, uh, what's acceptable to wear, what's not acceptable to wear. Um, there's commandments regarding public safety and health. Uh, you have commandments regarding a person's property that we're to cover up holes and uh, build fences so that people don't fall and hurt themselves. Uh, we have commandments regarding that if somebody has a contagious disease that they need to be quarantined. So. The 613 Commandments cover virtually every aspect of human existence, and sexuality uh, is not to be excluded from, from the commandments of Torah. Now, Leviticus chapter 18 predominantly deals with uh, forbidden sexual relations. So we're not going to – I'll just let you read Leviticus 18 on your own. The prohibitions, the commandments regarding sexuality and forbidden sexual relations is pretty clear cut. It's pretty cut and dry, pretty obvious. Um, you know, there's there's really no way to mistake what Leviticus 18 is trying to say in regards to uh, sexuality. But so we're gonna we're not gonna read any of these verses, but we're gonna uh, cite the verses. Uh, at least the the designation of the verses, and we're going to basically sum up what they're saying and what they are commanding. Now, there's 25 commandments in regards to forbidden sexual relations, but basically they could all be summed up in uh, a prohibition against incest. That's any sexual relation with anyone that you're related to, whether they're a blood relative or whether they are a relative by marriage or whether they're you know, half siblings or half relatives, and a prohibition against homosexuality. And when I mean homosexuality, I lump lesbianism because homo is just simply meaning mankind. Homo sapien uh, is, is human beings, mankind. So homosexuality uh, really covers lesbianism as well. So basically, it's prohibition with having sexual intercourse with the same sex. Uh, also, bestiality. Yeah, that's something pretty gross and pretty nasty that we don't really want to talk about or discuss. Some people are even creeped out just even by the word bestiality. Uh, and, and But sadly, uh, if, if this world tarries, that is where the, the uh, sexual revolution is going to go. It's already bleeding over into the acceptance and normalization of pedophilia. And once that is successfully has overtaken our culture, the next step in that parade is bestiality and the acceptance of bestiality. So um, without further ado, let's tackle the first commandment in 25, and it's uh, Leviticus 18.6. And this verse is basically alluding to and hinting at that we shouldn't be over familiar with relatives. It's okay to show love, and it's okay to show affection um, and public displays of affection, but we need to really be careful on how we do that. Uh, you've heard the term kissing cousins. Well, you know, the temptation is is to have relations with your cousin, especially if you don't see them very often, especially if they're the opposite sex and they're attractive. Um, you know, incest happens this way, and uh, as a result, children, because of the close ties in genetics, are born with uh, birth defects or mental disabilities or what have you. So in rabbinic law, 
in the rabbinic interpretation of Leviticus 18, they say that it's best to refrain from kissing, embracing, winking, or skipping, <laughs> which leads to incest. Kind of reminds me of a, a funny joke that we say that, um, you know, about Baptists and dancing, you know, that uh, uh, Baptists don't dance because it le leads to, to mixed bathing or mixed swimming, and it leads to uh, fornication and adultery. <laughs> it's just, it's taking it to the extreme. But I think what the rabbinic edict is trying to bring across in this particular uh, commandment is that sometimes we build fences around commandments. And building a fence around the commandment helps us to keep away from the commandment itself. A biblical example is God says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you will die. But Adam said to Eve, don't even touch it lest we die. God never said anything about touching the tree. And according to legend, when Satan was confronting Eve through the serpent regarding um, the prohibition of eating the tree, Eve said, well, we're not even supposed to touch it, and Satan pushes her up against the tree and says, well, you touched it. See, you didn't die. So there's a danger in one aspect of making fences around the law. If we make those fences on the same level and, have, and carry the same weight and authority as Torah itself, then there's a danger because we're putting man's regulations uh, on the same level as God's. But there's nothing wrong with making a fence around the law if it helps us to keep that particular commandment of Torah. If it helps us to stay far enough away that we don't toy with it in such a way that we're tempted to fall into uh, breaking one of the commandments. So the, the rabbis do have a good idea where they're saying don't be over familiar with relatives such as kissing and embracing and winking and skipping, you know, wrestling and playing around uh, because – that will lead to that could possibly lead to an ancestral relationship. Remember when Isaac was sporting, the King James says, with his wife Rebecca, and they passed each other off as brother and sister. Well, the king looked out the window and saw them wrestling, uh, sporting with one another, and I'm sure that sporting led to to fondling and caressing and probably a sexual encounter. And he's like, "Wait a second, they're supposed to be brother and sister. What's going on here? This this isn't right." And we see in movies all the time how people are you know, just toyfully, playfully joking around and wrestling and chasing and running, and they trip and fall on each other, and all of a sudden we see the sparks fly and the fireworks go off, and all of a sudden they start kissing, and you know the rest is history. So um, you know, as a minister, I'm very careful. Uh, regards to the opposite sex, especially because they're not my relatives, you know, biologically, uh, I'll shake hands, and when they go for a hug, I quickly maneuver so there's a sideways hug so that people don't get the wrong impression, people don't get the wrong idea. Um, as a minister, I have to put uh, safeguards in place uh, to where nothing can be said uh, inappropriately sexually regarding myself or the ministry. So I don't counsel women alone. I make sure my wife is there. Um, I don't meet with uh, women alone because it can turn into a he said, she said kind of deal. So there's this is kind of like along the same lines of this prohibition in Leviticus 18.6 where it's talking about not being over familiar with your, your relatives. Now next we have – in Leviticus 18.7, not to commit incest with one's mother. You know, that, that, that should be a given. Uh, also in Leviticus 18.7 is uh, drawn the negative commandment of not committing sodomy with one's father. And Leviticus 18.8 deals with uh, not committing incest with one's father's wife. So this is your father's wife who is not your mother, who is not biologically related to you. Uh, she would be considered a stepmother. Uh, so it's a prohibition against, against that. Moving on to Leviticus 18.9 is talking about uh, prohibiting incest with one's sister. This could be biological. This could be step. Um, Biological, non-biological, but if she's a sister through biology or a sister through marriage, it's prohibited to have any sexual relations with her. Leviticus 18.9 also talks about not committing incest with one's father's wife's daughter, and we just all you know basically covered that. So Leviticus 18 is getting very nitty-gritty and very specific 
leaving no wiggle room whatsoever in regards to who you can and cannot have sex with. Uh, what is a, an appropriate sexual relationship and what is an inappropriate sexual relationship. So it, sometimes it seems like we're repeating ourselves and dealing with these commandments, but it's taking uh, it's taking these commandments from all different sides and angles to make it abundantly clear and to make sure that there's no misinterpreting or no mistaking in regards to what is an appropriate and an inappropriate sexual relation according to God. So we have Leviticus 18.10, which is regarding um, the prohibition of incest with one's son's daughter. So this would conceivably be your grandchildren. Or again, this could be you know, a grandchild by marriage. It doesn't have to necessarily be you know, biologically your son's uh, child. It could be from a previous marriage from the mother, from the woman he took as a wife. And so we just read not committing incest with one's son's daughter, and the flip side of that commandment, also taken from Leviticus 18.18, 18, is not to commit incest with one's daughter's daughter. And Leviticus 18.12 uh, deals with the prohibition of um, committing incest with one's daughter and committing incest with one's father's sister. So this would be your aunt. On your father's side. And Leviticus 18.13 uh, prohibits uh, committing incest with one's mother's sister. This would be an aunt on your mother's side. Leviticus 18.14 prohibits committing incest with one's father's brother's wife. So this is an aunt through marriage. This is an aunt that is not biologically related to you. Leviticus 18.14 prohibits sodomy with one's father's brother. So this would be your blood uncle. And Leviticus 18.15 is prohibiting committing incest with your daughter-in-law. And Leviticus 18.16 uh, prohibits committing incest with one's brother's wife. So this is your sister-in-law. And Leviticus 18.17 uh, is prohibiting committing incest with one's wife's daughter. So this would be your stepdaughter. Also from this very same verse, we get the command and the prohibition uh, not to commit incest with the, with the daughter of one's wife's son. So this would be your step-granddaughter. And on the flip side, not to commit incest with the daughter of one's wife's daughter. And again, this would be your step-granddaughter. And Leviticus 18.18 18 prohibits incest with one's uh, wife's sister. So this would be your sister-in-law. So all of the commandments we just covered is basically prohibiting sexual relations with anyone who is related to you biologically or related to you through marriage. So any sexual relation with um, somebody other than your wife, uh, other than your spouse, that is a family member uh, biologically or a family member through marriage is defined and considered incest. Now Leviticus 18.19 is uh, prohibiting having sex with a woman uh, in the midst of her menstrual period. Because the blood flow is considered unclean. The blood flow is actually the result of the death of a viable egg or what was a viable egg. And so the blood flow is a symbol of loss of life. And, uh, you know, blood is very sacred. And um, Leviticus also says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you to make atonement for your souls upon the altar. Um, and this is talking about the animal sacrifice of the Levitical sacrificial system, and also pointing to and hinting at uh, the, the redeeming blood of Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, on the cross uh, because he was the sinless, perfect sacrifice. Uh, because Hebrews talks about that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. It covers it up, and it's only temporarily, but it can't take away sin or remove sin such as the blood of Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. So it says not to have intercourse with a woman in her menstrual period. 
this is unclean. We know that uh, blood, especially menstrual blood, um, just is considered a waste product. It's it's similar to urine and fecal matter. That in urine and fecal matter, we release toxins, we release uh, pathogens and and biological hazards and and other things that our body does not need or that is harmful to our body or to another person. So this menstrual blood is unclean. And when you have sexual relations with a woman in her menstrual uh, uh, blood, you could get sick. Uh, not only that, but she could get sick because the rate of cervical cancer in women who has sex during her menstrual period is a astronomical. And um, cervical cancer in Orthodox Jewish women is the lowest among women in all the world. Why? Because they keep the Torah commandment and prohibition against this, and it protects them from cancer and from other diseases. Uh, in Leviticus 18.20, it is the prohibition of having sexual intercourse with another man's wife. This would be considered adultery. It's in one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Some people may ask, what's the difference between adultery and fornication? Adultery is when you're married. And you're having sex with a with another married person, or um, you know, or it, it's it's sex with another married person, regardless if you're married or not. Uh, what is fornication? Fornication is having sexual relations with another person outside of the bonds of marriage. That's what fornication is. So now we get into the really gross stuff, but the Bible makes it plain and clear, black and white, leaves no wiggle room, leaves no room for misinterpretation or mistakes. It just lays it out on the line. Leviticus 18.22 is prohibiting sodomy with a male. Uh, homosexuality, um, basically, um, well, you know what it is. I'm not going to go any further. Uh, also, Leviticus 18.23 is prohibiting sexual intercourse with an animal. So this is the prohibition against bestiality. And finally, the last commandment uh, that's dealt with in Leviticus chapter 18 is um, prohibiting the castration of any male of any species, whether it be a human being or whether it be an animal. Now, this last one is more of a rabbinic command that they say they can extra extrapolate from the wording and the language of the original Hebrew of Leviticus 18, but there is no specific verse that cites um, not to castrate uh, a, a, a human being uh, or an animal. They say that uh, through the original language of, of the Hebrew that it is implied. And I believe the reasoning behind this is because of the commandment in Genesis where, um, you know, when the creation of Adam and Eve and also uh, post-flood with Noah and his family, God commanded be fruitful and multiply, implying don't hinder the uh, reproductive process. Uh, there's natural ways to um, plan and be safe in regards to uh, the reproductive process without having to damage the organs that God has created to reproduce. And after a certain time, they stop reproducing on their own, a natural stopping point uh, of reproduction. But until then, you just plan and play it safe, and, and, uh, but you do this without having any surgical alterations to one's sexual organs or reproductive organs. Um, and also just just castration uh, was it was used in a lot of um, subservient uh, ways when one nation conquered another as far as slavery and humiliation. But it was also done in a lot of pagan um, religions and rituals and practices to dedicate oneself to that pagan deity and or religion. Hey, guys, thanks so much for listening. Go out there and have a great day. God bless. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to check out and subscribe to our social media accounts on Instagram at AD underscore international, on Facebook at Abraham's Descendants International, on Twitter at ADINT Ministries, and on Blogger at Ray Bash's Ramblings. And don't forget to check out and bookmark our website, abrahamsdescendants.com. Shalom.
Abrahamsdescendants.com, getting back to the first century in a 21st century way.